What's up my pre-calc people? Michael Princhak here and in this video we're going to tackle topic 1.8 of AP pre-calculus over rational functions and zeros. Now on the surface this looks like a really 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 simple topic with only one learning objective and two essential knowledge pieces but it's actually really really tricky because there's a couple things a lot of kids misinterpret or look over that makes the problems kind of hard but hopefully after watching this video it'll all be really really easy so let's dive into it right now. The real zeros of a rational function correspond to the real zeros of the numerator for such values in its domain. Pretty simple sentence, but it has a lot of meaning to it. First, we know that real zeros come from the numerator of a rational function, but they have to be in the domain. And that's the one part that a lot of kids overlook. So in simple terms, the zeros of a rational function are values of x that make the numerator equal to zero that are in the domain. They have to be in the domain. If an x value is not in the domain, it cannot be a zero. So we should probably spend a little bit of time talking about exactly what we mean by the domain. Now the domain of a rational function includes all real numbers except those that make the denominator zero. If a particular value of x makes the denominator of a rational function zero, it must be excluded from the domain. So let's look at a couple practice problems. In each example, what we're going to do is we're going to look at exactly how to identify the domain and then how to check for zeros. Now, some kids do that in reverse. They look for zeros first, but then the key thing we have to do is we can't list something as a zero if it's not the domain. So I like to think about the domain first. That way, when I list a zero, I make sure that it's not a value that was excluding the domain because if it was, well, then it can't be a zero. In this first example here, we see a basic rational function. Now, this is what we call standard form. So the numerator is in standard form, the denominator is in standard form, which is awesome when it comes to understanding end behavior, which we learned about back in topic 1.7. But when it comes to talking about zeros, vertical asymptotes, and holes, two topics that are coming next, we want it to be in factored form. It's just a lot easier to process when it's in factored form. So first thing we want to do anytime we're talking about zeros, holes, or vertical asymptotes, we want to make sure we put it in factored form. So here it is. Now when we look at this, any number that turns a denominator into zero must be excluded from the domain. So pretty obvious to see that negative five makes a denominator zero. So our domain is going to be negative infinity to negative five and then negative five to infinity. Basically all real numbers except for negative five. Now let's look at the numerator because any value that makes a numerator zero, as long as it's in the domain, is a zero of the rational function. And of course we see three and negative two. Now, both of those are in the domain because the only number not in the domain is negative five. That means this particular rational function has two real zeros, three and negative two. Now this next example, once again, it's always easier to factor first. So when we factor it, the next thing we like to do is look at the denominator. What values must be excluded from the domain? And of course, in this example, that's gonna be positive two. Positive two makes the denominator zero, so we must exclude it from the domain. So the domain is negative infinity to two, two to infinity. Then we look at the numerator. What values make the numerator zero? And of course, that's two and four. Okay, great, but the problem is two is excluded from the domain because it also makes the denominator zero. So I cannot list two as a zero because it's already excluded from the domain. So this particular rational function has one and only one zero at positive four. In this third example, once again, we want to factor the numerator and factor the denominator, and we see that there are two values that we must exclude in the domain because they make the denominator zero. And that is, of course, three and negative four. So our domain is going to be negative infinity to negative four, negative four to three, and three to infinity. All real numbers work except for, well, negative four and three. Now we're going to look at our denom or excuse me, now we're going to look at our numerator to find out what our zeros are. And of course we see two values that make the numerator zero, three and negative three. But three was already excluded from the domain. It makes the, do the numerator and the denominator equal zero, so it cannot be listed as a zero. So the only zero for this rational function is negative three. Again, yes, I know three turns the numerator into zero, but it also turns the denominator into zero. And that's unfortunately the number one mistake that kids make is they look solely at the numerator for zeros. They don't look at the denominator, and that's because they don't fully read that definition that zeros of a rational function make the numerator zero, but they have to be in the domain. And in this particular problem, three is not in the domain, so I cannot list it as a zero. 
And this next problem, again, the first thing we want to do is make sure you factor it. And then I like to go straight to the denominator. What values must be excluded from the domain? In this particular problem, we see five and negative two. Both five and negative two make the denominator zero. So they must be excluded. So our domain is negative infinity to negative two, negative two to five, and five to infinity. Now let's look at the numerator to find out if we have any zeros. And of course, we see three halves and positive five. But once again, positive five was already excluded from our domain, so we cannot list it as a zero because positive five makes both the numerator and the denominator equal to zero. So the only zero for this rational function is three halves or 1.5. In this final example, well, we don't have to factor anything because, well, there's nothing to factor. The denominator is already its own linear factor, x minus three, and the numerator is an unfactorable quadratic, x squared plus five. So of course, first thing we're gonna do is look at the denominator. I have to exclude all values, well, I have to include all values except for three, so I'm gonna exclude three. So negative infinity to three, three to infinity is my domain. Now, if I look at that, that, if I look at that numerator, there are no values that make it zero. Now, how do I recognize that? Well, once we could try to factor it, but we could realize it cannot be factored. Go ahead and use the quadratic formula if you want. If you use the quadratic formula, you get a negative inside the square root, which means, well, there's no real zeros, which means this particular rational function has no zeros. If we look at a graph, we're not gonna see across the x-axis at any place. Now, that doesn't change the domain. The domain still needs to exclude three, but there are just no zeros for this particular rational function, which does happen. So long story short, what we want to do when we're looking for zeros of a rational function is look in the numerator. Zeros come from the numerator, but they have to be in the domain. So to keep it simple, if there is an x value that makes both the numerator and the denominator equal to zero, it cannot be listed as a zero. Zeros of a rational function have to solely make the numerator zero and not the denominator as well. Now there's one more essential knowledge piece from this particular topic that doesn't seem to connect to zeros, but it actually does because we need the zeros to figure this out. And that's solving rational inequalities. The real zeros of both polynomial functions, the one, the numerator and the one, the denominator are endpoints or asymptotes for intervals satisfying the rational function inequalities r of x greater than or equal to zero, or r of x equals less than or equal to zero. So long story short, here's the deal. If you're solving a rational function inequality, so you got a rational function, numerator on top, denominator on the bottom, and you got that inequality, greater than or equal to zero, less than or equal to zero. If you're trying to solve this, all zeros, zeros that make the numerator zero, zeros that make the denominator zero, any value that makes the numerator or the denominator zero needs to be it looked at or analyzed as potential endpoints or asymptotes that are gonna help you satisfy or solve that rational function inequality. Now, reading that or hearing that may seem a little bit confusing, so let's look at an example to make sure it makes complete sense. So here we have a pretty simple rational function. We're asked to find out where this function is greater than or equal to zero. So the first thing we're gonna do is factor it to find all of the zeros from the numerator and the denominator, and there are three of them. We have three, negative two, and negative five. Once we've identified all of those, even though two of them are zeros and one of them is not, but we have to identify all of those. Any value that makes numerator or the denominator zero needs to be analyzed for these inequality problems. All right, so the first thing I wanna do is I wanna put all of those numbers on a number line. Negative five is first, then negative two, then three. Now I want you to notice I have filled in solid dots at negative two and three. That's because at negative two and three, we are allowed to equal zero. Negative two and three are already identified as zeros of this rational function. They make only the numerator zero. So they are gonna be filled in dots because I am allowed to be those values. Negative five isn't a very important value. It's called a critical value for this, you know, for this inequality, but I'm not allowed to be negative five because it's excluded from the domain. So that's gonna be an open dot. Next thing we want to do to determine the solution is start to do what we call test points. All we have to do is pick a number in each of these four intervals below negative five, in between negative five and negative two, in between negative two and three, and then greater than three and test them and see what happens. Are we gonna get a positive number, which means we're greater than zero, which is actually what this question wants us to find, or are we gonna get a negative number, which is below zero, which means we don't want that number in our final answer. So here's the result of this. It's called a sign chart. So basically pick a number below negative five, like negative 10. Negative 10 minus three is a negative. Negative 10 plus two is a negative. Negative 10 plus five is a negative. So that's gonna be a negative times a negative on top divided by a negative on the bottom. Three negatives makes a negative overall. So any number below negative five is gonna result in a number less than zero or a negative. 
Now pick a number between negative five and negative two, like negative four. Negative four minus three is negative. Negative four plus two is negative. Negative four plus five, well that's gonna be a positive. So two negatives and a positive is gonna result in an overall positive value. So numbers between negative five and negative two are positive. Then we're gonna pick a number between negative two and three, like one. One minus three is negative. One plus two is positive. One plus five is positive. So one negative, two positive is gonna make a negative overall. Finally, a number greater than three, like a thousand. A thousand minus three is positive. A thousand plus two is positive. A thousand plus five is positive. And three positives are, of course, gonna make a positive. So now we're looking for the answer to this inequality. Where are we greater than or equal to zero? So we're looking for where we are positive. So that's gonna happen between negative five and negative two, but we wanna parenthesis on the negative five, bracket on the negative two, because we are allowed to equal negative two, can equal negative five, makes the denominator zero. And then also bracket three towards infinity. That's gonna be the solution to this inequality. Now, one more thing I wanna take a look at is the actual graph of this. You can actually see it in a graph. So here is a graph of this. I know we might not have learned everything at this point, but we do see a slant asymptote and a vertical asymptote. And those are kind of happening, you know, negative five is where that uh, vertical asymptote is happening. So notice before negative five. So from negative infinity to negative five, the piece of the graph is all down in the negative. It's all below the x-axis. Yes, it's below the slant asymptote, but don't worry about that right now. What I'm looking at right now is that it's less than zero, it's negative. Then from negative five to that first zero at negative two, we are positive, we are above the x-axis. Then in between negative two and three, we are below the x-axis, those are negative values. And then from three towards infinity, we're back to being positive. So again, our two solution sets are negative five and negative two, and then three to infinity. Just make sure you have brackets on the negative two and the three because we are allowed to equal those values. All right, let's look at a second example here. So once again, here is a function h, always easier to factor it first, and we're asked to find where is h less than or equal to zero. So again, all numbers matter, all zeros matter. Zeros from the numerator, zeros from the denominator, they all matter in answering this question. So again, the reason why this particular topic about solving rational inequalities is in this topic is because, well, we need the zeros from the numerator, which we learned about already, but we also need the zeros from the denominator, which we learned about already as well, because those need to be excluded from the domain. But all of them count when you're trying to solve the inequality for where are we in this particular problem less than or equal to zero. So I have three of them. I have three, negative three, and four. All are gonna go onto my number line in order, negative four, negative three, and three. Notice that the only one that's filled in solid dot is negative three because negative three is the only zero of the entire rational function. Three and negative four are not in the domain, so they need to be skipped and they need to be holes there. Or, or not holes, but open dots, meaning I can't equal to them. So now what I get, I wanna test out my four values. So here we go, pick a number below negative four. You can be even dramatic like negative 1,000. Negative 1,000 minus three is negative. Negative 1,000 plus three is negative. Negative 1,000 minus three is negative again. Negative 1,000 plus four is negative. Four negatives make it overall positive. And then again, test each subsequent interval. All you gotta do is pick a number in that interval. You don't really care about what the numerical value is, just if it's gonna be a positive or a negative. And then that's how you know if you're gonna be above or below the x axis. So for this particular question, we're looking for negative. We want h of x to be less than or equal to zero. And after I finish my sign chart, the only interval where that happens is from negative four to negative three, parenthesis on the negative four, bracket on the negative three, because I am allowed to equal negative three. Now, just to take a look at the graphs, you can actually see this. Here's a graph that has a vertical asymptote at negative four. It also has a hole at positive three you see there. So again, left of negative four, look at the graph, it's above the x-axis, it's positive. From that vertical asymptote to negative four to that first zero at negative three, that is where we are below. That's where we see that the blue graph is below the x-axis. That's of course the solution here. And then from negative three to positive three, we're positive. And from three to infinity, we're also positive. The reason why we skipped three is because there's a hole there, which we are gonna learn about in the next couple topics. But when there is a hole, there's nothing there. Remember, three was not in the domain of this function because three makes the denominator zero, so it's gotta be skipped over. So that's how we work on solving these rational inequalities. Just make sure that the first thing you do is find all values, any value that makes the numerator or makes the denominator zero, and then put them on a number line and then start doing your test intervals. But it's really important that you recognize which values are gonna be included because they allow us to equal zero. And that's, of course, why we have to understand the original you know, essential knowledge piece that we learned is that zeros of a rational function 
come from the numerator as long as that they are in the domain. All right, that's it for topic 1.8. Hopefully made a lot of sense. And now it's time to practice. See you in the next video.